I'm Dan Carell, CEO of the Digital Commerce Alliance, and this is Commerce Code, a bi-weekly digital commerce podcast for leaders in card linking, loyalty and digital marketing, mobile wallets and payments, and financial data. Thanks for joining this running conversation with leaders in the industry. And if you like this podcast, come join us at a Digital Commerce Alliance event. You can learn more at www.digcomall.org. This week, Dan is talking with Rana Gudral from Behavioral Signals, a company that facilitates AI-mediated conversations to bridge the communication gap between humans and machines by introducing emotional intelligence. Rana is the chief executive officer. Today, Dan and Rana are talking about how machines are able to understand human emotions and change their behavior to match, how AI-mediated conversations can impact outcomes of call center conversations, why companies are choosing to incorporate these sorts of interactions into their software solutions. Stay tuned for a deep dive into the subject of emotionally intelligent machines. Commerce Code is sponsored by Pentadata, the all-in-one financial data API. Whether it is bank account data, credit card transaction data, or credit reports and credit scores, Pentadata has it all in one simple and easy-to-use API. With coverage of over 6,000 banks, over 200 million credit files, and 60 million merchants, you can get all the data you need for your apps at pentadatainc.com. Rana, welcome back to Commerce Code. It is great to have you. And just to start off, where are you joining us from? I'm currently in the San Francisco Bay Area. And thanks for having me here. It's a real pleasure to be back. Thanks, Dan. Great. Now, today we're talking, should AI be used to interpret human emotions? And, you know, if if listeners want some more backstory on this or just interested in behavioral signals, Rana was with us for episode 87 of Commerce Code. That was way back in November of 2021. So now it's been a year and a half. And over the last few decades, there's just been these moments when AI kind of went cold, you know, so investment or excitement or whatever dried up. And, you know, in the AI world, those those are called AI winters. And, you know, I assume that you've you've maybe lived through what felt like that at times, but it's got to feel pretty different right now, eh? Yeah, I've I've been in this industry for a while and I've seen sort of like the euphoria and complete disdain (laughs) and a cycle and uh, we're back in. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. So I'd call it an AI heat wave currently. So we've got large language models, chat GPT, you know, big investments, big tech players, Google, Microsoft fighting over over, you know, what's going to become of all this. So I think it's a great time uh, to be talking with you again about what's going on in AI and particularly in, in this case, kind of machine human interactions. And so, you know, I'll just frame it at this level, which is, you know, AI does a lot of stuff that basically is just better software than before. But that stuff doesn't sort of touch humans directly. So maybe it optimizes a process. Maybe it figures out how to uh, tailor the contents of a document better or whatever. And I think I think we probably will all react to that as, hey, that's just better functionality than we used to have. And we maybe won't think about or care whether that's machine learning or not. And so that's one thing. But then there's stuff like large scale facial recognition, or in the case of what you're doing at at behavioral signals, we've got sort of voice recognition and analysis, but at a really interesting level. And I think that's a bit of a different animal. That's kind of what we're talking about today. So, So let me just catch us up on some basics, which is to start with, just tell us what Behavioral Signals Technology basically does. We are a deep learning company, and we're building advanced models that extract intelligence from a conversation or a dialogue. So it's a, it's a very specific area of research. Our specific focus in that particular space is extracting intelligence from acoustics of a conversation. So to better understand that, in a conversation, there are two primary elements. One is the content, the spoken word. And then there is the acoustics of the conversation, such as pitch and tonal variance, prosody, intonations, or how something is being said. And we've been a pioneer in this field of behavioral signal processing, which is the technology behind how all of these things become possible. And we focus on the latter, and we extract a variety of very intelligent signals from the acoustics of the conversation. And we're very proud to be the first to market and probably have the best performing technology in this space. When you're thinking about that, the, the type of signals that we can extract from a live interaction 
using our tonal engines can roughly be put in three categories. There's emotions like anger, happiness, sadness, and then there are behavior signals like engagement, empathy, politeness. And the third bucket is actually most interesting, which is a collection of advanced and specialized classifiers that track macro KPIs that the industry really cares about, such as identifying a customer's live satisfaction score or live NPS in the moment and identifying agent engagement, doing complex things like identifying is someone in stress or duress. And we've also built a few advanced prediction engines, such as predicting if a customer will buy or not buy or debt holder will pay or not pay. So fairly diverse set of applications. I mean, it can be applied in a half a dozen different industries, both in the human to human and human to machine interactions. And But we have a specific focus that we've gone after. As you describe that, some of that stuff sounds to me like things that humans can do or maybe naturally do, but you can't do it at scale and you can't gather it, you can't analyze it. And then some of it sounds like stuff that maybe we don't do or can't do or don't do a good job of. I mean, am I right about that? Is there some aspect of like, hey, we're building machines that in part can give us insights that people can't give themselves? Yeah. So, you know, you hear a lot about AI and machine learning and a lot of what you see out there from AI machine learning is not really AI, it's just good software. But when you look at deep tech and deep learning, your primary purpose is really replicating innate human ability that is unique to humans and giving the software machines that same ability. And so for the most part, yes, that's what the complexity is. Like, so humans are born with a natural ability to extract these signals, emotions from tone of voice. Our brains do it without any effort. Babies can do it without language skills are actually developed. And so, well, how do you actually have a machine do it? I mean, so first you have to understand it, decode it, build models around it, and then train machines to do something that is a very, very human thing to do. And then sometimes when you teach the machines, machines not only learn, but they start to do it better than humans. And that's kind of where we're at, right? So we track it using a score called F-score. And so currently our F-scores are now, to be exact, is 0.92. It's higher than an average human's, which is 0.8, which means that our engines are able to do this better than an average human can. So that makes it even more exciting. Oh, that's great. I, I love the mention of babies. And I know that you know, having... Having read a fair bit about AI just because it's interesting stuff, you know, it, it makes you one of the things that I think is great about learning about AI is it makes you reflect on what we are, right? And what, like, how is it, what does it mean to say in, something's intelligent? There's an old saying, uh, this is an Oliver Rundle Holmes quote, yeah. you know, he says, even a dog knows the difference between being tripped over and being kicked. And right. there's a sense in which animals, certain, some animals more than others, right? It just depends. We all have different kinds of intelligence, right? But some animals, you know, have a certain, they can feel it, right? My dog, I have a dog who can absolutely feel when I'm upset. And it, it bugs me because whenever I get angry, he instantly, he knows it. He feels it. I think he's better wired for that than probably most humans are. And just in his particular case, we've got another dog who hasn't got a clue and doesn't care. So there you go, right? But coming back to kind of the commerce world, I can think of a lot of potential use cases here. But I want to hear it from you. Like, what is the use case that you mainly think of? Like, what's the valuable use cases you see it now? So as I said, there are probably uh, half a dozen companies that can be built on this technology. We've gone after a specific opportunity. We've built a product we call AIMC or AI Immediate Conversations, and it involves building profiles of customers and call center agents based on past interactions. Think of these profiles as a conversational bioprint, and it's a complex vector file of 75 to 100 attributes that range from how fast someone speaks to various emotions and behaviors they exude in a conversation. And we can create this profile using a two-minute audio interaction from the past, both for agents and clients, and that uniquely identifies how a person converses. It's as unique to a person uh, in many ways that uh, similar to as, a, say, a fingerprint is. And once we have that information, our, our product essentially finds the best conversational partner and has those predefined matches in the system and so for the next conversation that needs to happen, rather than being paired to a random agent, we look for your ideal partner and see if that's available or the next best or the next best. And then we put those people together. And then all the industry KPIs, everything gets impacted. So we're looking at you know double digit impact, which is three to four times than the industry averages by focusing on the science of bringing the right people together. And we're the first to actually be able to do that at scale with a system that runs behind the scene without any human intervention and is fully dynamic and real time and is purely built on tone of voice analysis, which means 
no private information or the content of the spoken word. It's not invasive, which is, you know, as you know, it's a huge problem with AI. We'll talk about that. And so that's that's our focus and that's what we're bringing to market. And largely we happen to be focused on the BFSI, which is the financial sector. So public and private banks and BPOs and collection houses. But for the most part, it's fairly broad. It can be applied in any call center. We're talking about intelligence right now, but I just realized that I'm kind of dumb because I had never occurred to me I kind of knew it, but I didn't put the the pieces together, Rana, that if you're doing a pure tonal analysis, that that removes a lot of the concerns, privacy stuff, et cetera. I mean, it it raises a whole interesting new, because I don't think anyone has ever given thought to like, well, do you have a privacy interest in your tone of voice, right? As opposed to like the, the actual information you're sharing. So that's super interesting but that it does sort of solve some very real problems. And I think we're going to discover in the next decade a whole bunch of ways, as we are now, we're already working on it, but like ways in which we can disaggregate information and analyze aspects or angles of it in a way that provides a lot of insight without treading on whatever we decide people's privacy and and information ownership rights are. And I think that's going to be an interesting ongoing conversation. Okay, so we are going to get, as you've alluded to, into some of the ethical kind of and practical questions But one way of thinking about this is kind of opportunity cost. And so I just wanted to ask you the following question, which is, let's imagine somebody comes along, it's more likely to be, you know, the EU or or the state of California or some specific, you know, entity. And they come along and they say, hey, we don't like machines doing this kind of stuff, right? We don't want machines analyzing human emotions. If we were to go that route, what would we lose, right? So what's the opportunity cost? And I'd just be interested to kind of get your assessment there. This is uh, my most fun question, so uh, thanks for asking this. When you go back and sort of think about this from a broad perspective, you have to go back to one of the quotes uh, from one of the founding fathers of AI, Marvin Minsky, and he was once questioned about machine emotions, and really the question was, should machine actually have emotions, which is kind of the question that you're asking today. And he answered by saying that the question is not whether intelligent machines can have any emotions but whether machines can be intelligent without any emotions, right? Because it's a very fundamental part of intelligence, like you actually said earlier. Can you actually even be intelligent without having the ability to understand emotions and behaviors? And the answer is no. You're probably smart, but you're not intelligent. And so I think the opportunity cost is huge. So there's a couple of things, right? So I think we all agree what we can bet on is that where we are going, we're going to depend on machines more and more. That's a given. It's a given. The second thing is, which we all agree on, is that machines are going to become more and more intelligent, incredibly more intelligent, even get to a point where probably we don't even comprehend what intelligence actually is. I mean, maybe a thousand times more intelligence than the human brain at some point in the future. With these two truths in mind, would you rather have that machine that you're interacting with and depending on, which is extremely intelligent, emotionally aware or not? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. So how would you respond to a human question in that human context? So if you have a human, let's say, who you depend on, who's very intelligent, who's not emotionally aware, that is a clinical version of a psychopath, right? Mm. And so would we want machine psychopaths? I mean, an emotionally intelligent machine would typically be more ethical and fairer rather than a very intelligent machine that you're depending on, that controls you in many ways, but who has no ability to process emotions. I think that's pretty dangerous. I think it's a huge opportunity cost. It feels to me like the path of not going this direction is an attempt to say, hey, let's just cut this off so we don't have to deal with the complexity of the problem. And, and, and to be particular, your point is machines that are capable of having a sense of emotions or that, or that are sensing emotions at the same time as they are sensing words or ideas, that they'll have a more holistic perspective. Of course, with that has to be bundled in a set of parameters or expectations for what machines should value, right? In terms of like what they're trying to get done. And that that, all of that sounds like hard work. Like that sounds like you have to roll up your sleeves, right? Put on your overalls and go do it. And so it seems like the objections to this, to a certain extent, are either a, hey, we won't succeed at that hard work, or a, I just wish we didn't have to do the hard work. You know, to me, it feels that way. I don't even think about that. Yeah, I mean, I think there's uncertainty, right? There are some ethical questions that come into play. We are realizing that we're moving very fast towards an AGI. And when that happens, what is our significance? What does it mean to be human? And so some of the things that we have cherished and say, okay, sure, we can't do compute as fast as the machine can or process information or data, but 
arts ours and emotions ours and what we're realizing it's not really you know machines doing art machines writing poems writing story scripts pretty good and uh, you can't tell the difference and people like it and so now so there, there's fear uncertainty and doubt and that whole thought factor creates a lot of these concerns and i think they're valid concerns i mean i think so it's more about are we making the right decision we're moving too fast are we stopping to take some time to think through this or are we going into the right direction but i think holistically when you look at some of these things it's a train that's left the station uh, it's going you can't really stop it but you need to understand it you need to understand how to deal with it and we benefit tremendously from some of those experiences and we need to sort of magnify those and be cautious about the ones that we potentially could be harmed by yeah i, I think there's a, just a ton of potential here and and it's 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 usual story of we i hope are um, happy about and we appreciate the things that have gone well over the decades in terms of making life better and making things work better because they do on balance uh work a lot better than they used to but there's the aspect of you know we we tend not to think about all the things that don't work well until someone comes along and and makes it work better at scale and then you go oh geez wow that's great and so i think that that's what we're looking for there's so many opportunities with the application of ai in this space but there's this narrative of people being concerned i wonder if there's a single objection or concern or fear that you think is most well grounded like what's the thing that you think is i mean to the extent that you have a concern about ai what would it be what's the best concern I think there are two big concerns. The one is a lack of understanding around how it works, so the proverbial AI black box. And I right. think that is a big concern because you, you, you know, you're making these decisions. Those decisions impact real humans and the quality of life. And do you even understand how those decisions are being made? I mean, first of all, the clients certainly don't, or the ones who are impacted by it. But oftentimes, the companies that are building these black boxes don't either. Do we know how ChatGPT out of the billion parameters or hundreds of billions of parameters are coming up with those answers? The answer is no, we don't. And so I think that's a concern because we're losing control there a little bit and it's going to get worse. And the second one is more sort of at the ground level, which is the big problem of AI that is quality of the data sets used in the training of the models. Data sets are fuel for the AI model, just like gasoline. Whether they are tasked with generating text, recognizing objects or predicting a company's stock price, the AI systems are really learning by sifting through complex examples and discerning patterns in the data. But these AI and machine learning data sets, just like the humans that design them, they're not without flaws. And we know that there are biases and mistakes that color many of the libraries that used to train benchmark test models, and then highlighting the danger in placing too much trust in data that hasn't been thoroughly vetted, even when the data comes from trusted sources. And that's a huge issue, right? And so I think those are, those are the big concerns I have. I'm really concerned about those areas. Yeah, absolutely. And I think AI is augmenting human decisions rather than replacing them at this stage. And, and maybe that goes on forever. I don't know. But, you know, I, I think of it the following way, which is, you know, I've, I've played with chat GPT, as I suppose everybody has at this point, and it doesn't concern me. It, it, I mean, it's, it is a little alarming, honestly, like you play with it and you kind of go, holy cow, you can see how transformative it is. But it's not that concerning because to me, it's always going to be intermediated by somebody like, you know, I'll ask it a question in a space that I have some familiarity with. And it's a little bit like asking, let's imagine you've just hired somebody fresh out of college. You ask them the same question, they come back with an answer and it'd be more like the next day it wouldn't be 30 seconds later and you're there to sort of assess you can kind of eyeball it and say like does this seem right right and we're we're still doing that so as long as there's a person there that's sort of doing that it on the one hand i think limits the potential danger or concern about it but of course the real potential of ai is to be able to operate at scale and to get away from everything having to be, because if it has to be intermediated by me, then we're just losing an enormous amount of the potential productivity of an AI application to say, well, yeah, it's faster, but it always has to be looked at by a person who can eyeball it, scratch their chin and say, well, does this thing seem right? But I think that's where we're at with, with a lot of stuff. So I guess that the question is, do you think that that's like, how long are we going to be there? Because in that augmenting human decisions, you guys have built a system that I think is naturally risk controlled. Is that like just hearing your description of what it's doing? I'm thinking about like, what's the worst that can happen? The answer is I, I don't see a nightmare scenario at all. What I do see is a, an optimization that makes a ton of sense. But, you know, what do you make of my take that for a lot of the AI these days, it's really just augmenting humans and it's not really creating as much efficiency as it will or it could? I broadly agree with you from a current state standpoint. I mean, AI is designed really right now to assist with decision making when the data parameters and variables involved 
are beyond human comprehension. So that's kind of, for the most part, what the AI systems are doing and to make the right decisions using those constraints. However, I mean, AI notoriously fails in capturing or responding to intangible human factors that go into real life decision making, the ethical, moral, and other human considerations that guide the course of business, life, society, at large, right? So the proverbial trolley problem, I, I'm sure you've heard of that mm-hmm. hypothetical social scenario where you have to make a choice between killing one person or killing five person and, you know, sh- shifting the, the train, you know, how do you make that choice? And so at the moment, AI is based on algorithms that respond to models and data and often misses the big picture and most times can't analyze a decision with, with reasoning behind it. It isn't really ready to zoom human qualities that emphasize empathy, ethics, and morality, It is changing fast though, right? And so AI keeps creeping closer to the point in which it can make independent subjective decisions without human input. I mean, you've already seen some of that, a little taste of it, like such as DALI and massive language transformers such as GPT-3, BERT, Jurassic, you know, with deep vision learning models that are coming close to matching human abilities. So it's making decisions independent, but it still has a long ways to go in making ultimate decisions in real world or life situations that require more holistic subjective reasoning. And it may make the right decisions based on the facts, but we may like the empathy that needs to be part of that decision. So for now, I think it's augmented intelligence instead of pure artificial intelligence. But I mean, I definitely believe that it's going to get there. It's not a question whether that is possible or not. I think it, it is possible and it, it, we get there at some point. It's an area, to, I'll mention two things, and we don't need to go deep on policy stuff because I think you can you can chase your tail forever on data ownership and privacy law, whatever, but a couple things. One is um, there was a big, big as in long argument at the Supreme Court on Section 230, which is the kind of a, a critical piece of law for the internet. And AI kind of came up. So number one, this stuff is super hard because they're trying to figure out questions. You know, in that case, it's sort of about did a company do something when an algorithm did it? Or did the company sort of not do anything because the algorithm did it? I mean, that's not that's not quite the right way to describe it legally, but that's pretty close to the question. And I think it was Gorsuch and, and some of the other justices got into this and saying, well, I don't know. I mean, we're very close to having AI that is going to feel off an awful lot like it's doing things. So then what then? You know. And so that's one thing. And then the other thing is both the, in the US and in Europe, there have been early efforts to sort of articulate it, what, what people have kind of casually styled as an AI bill of rights. In other words, What are the rights that humans have vis-a-vis machines, roughly? And I I put it this way, if I've consented for some company to have my data, does that mean that I've consented for them to use that data and kind of let loose some artificial intelligence on that data? Is that the same thing? And I think it's a question that just simply hasn't really been asked for the most part and certainly hasn't really been answered. But I'm curious to get your take. Like, what do you make of that question? You know, do, do you think those two things are the same? Like, what do you what do you make of that? But if you look at the Bill of Rights, you know, as the document acknowledges, the blueprint is it's a non-binding white paper and does not really, at the moment, affect any policies, the interpretation or the implementation. So we don't really know what to make of it and where it goes. But on data privacy, I mean, AI or not, there's a few things. And I think where sort of philosophically, that's where the, the document actually goes. So you should, one, be protected from abusive data practices. We have built-in protections. And you should have agency over how the data about is used, being used, whether that's being done through a human or AI, it, that shouldn't matter, it should be material, right? And you should also know, it is an AI system, you should know that an automated system is being used and understand how and why it contributes to the outcome that impacts you. So I think that also it makes sense to even companies like me and person like me who is building those systems. And you should be able to opt out where appropriate and have access to a person who you can quickly consider and remedy problems that you encounter. So all of those things are no brainers. All of this is addressed in the white paper. I feel it's in the right direction. But that said, I think some of the aspects are problematic. And I think that's where, because it's so broad and wishy-washy, it's like, not only some claims in the white paper overstate the potential risk, but they also make it harder for the United States to compete against, say, China in the global race for AI advantage. And it's a race. You know, some of these things could do more harm than good, at least from a broader perspective. In principle, I feel like, you know, the heart's in the right place, but I'm not really convinced that the government will do it right. So we'll see. So let me finish with the kind of the last question, which is to come back to kind of, you know, both the opportunity, like what can we achieve here? 
I think there's a ton of opportunity, right? Like I think there's a ton of, and I'm not that concerned about the risk, honestly. And you can maybe tell from what I've said before, like, I think it is a roll up your sleeves, put on your overalls, do the hard work, figure out how to make this stuff great because that's the way forward. It's not, it's not backward. And yet I think that we could be sitting in a real different world in two, three years or one year. I don't know. And so I'd love to get your, you know, as an expert, your perspective on what do you kind of dream about at behavioral signals? If, if everything works really well and things go kind of like according to your your plan or what you imagine, where are we going to be in a few years that's really cool? Like where's a consumer or maybe somebody in the, in the commerce world going to say, wow, this is awesome that we can do this now? You know, there's tremendous amount of opportunities. There's opportunities around potentially solving big, big problems around diseases, around food, around lack of water. All of those things are the opportunities. Of course, there are small, low-hanging fruits like you know the stuff that we in the Silicon Valley are, for the most part, going after, which is improving you know customer experience and all these other things. But there are other bigger problems. I mean, with protein folding and all that, I mean, we'll probably see cure for cancer and other things uh, mm-hmm. coming out really, really soon. And it's happening already. So in the next four or five years, you'd see tremendous amount of value add being created, which is super exciting. How fast is it going to move? I think it's been moving really fast. As a humanity, we just started to notice it four months ago since ChatGPT came out. That's it. I mean, it's been, it's been moving very, very fast for a very, very long period of time. There's newer things. I mean, I'm exposed to some of the things that are extremely mind-boggling. A fun question to ask these brilliant brains that I sometimes interact with is like, what do you think? When do we get to AGI? And what I've seen is that pretty much everybody is floating between a number of, say, 10 years from now to 20 years from now. And that's like not even much time. I mean, we'll still be here. (laughs) Maybe we'll be doing a podcast and there's an AGI there. And so it'd be a very different world. And so, you know, I think most people believe that we get there very, very soon. There's a lot of stuff that can be done through machine learning, artificial intelligence, large language models, all of this, and in ways and areas that are well beyond what most of us would think about uh, moment to moment. And it, it has the potential to be transformative and, and great in terms of like what, what it can do for us in the world. So I, I'm excited about this stuff. And I think that these things get built in, you know, you call it little low hanging fruit pieces you're working on Silicon Valley, but I, I just regard it as the vast majority of economic progress happens because people took out one problem at a time and you know you're solving something over at behavioral signals that is foundational to some other thing you haven't even thought of and it's going to be supportive of some solution that is beyond what you're thinking about now because we're not we're not smart enough to know what those things are maybe the machines will be in 10 years but uh, that's what i'm excited about that's what i think is great and why it's fun to have these conversations ron i want to just say thank you for uh, taking a bunch of time today to kind of download with us and talk through some of the ethical stuff and some of the practical stuff and so thanks for joining us and uh, you know we'll look forward to having you back in the future Thank you, Dan. It was a real pleasure. Commerce Code is brought to you in part by Vantage Score. Nine of the top 10 banks and over 3,000 leading banks and fintechs use Vantage Score to predict and manage repayment risk. Learn more about the latest advances in credit scoring and how to grow your lending business by leveraging financial inclusion at VantageScore.com. Imagine a world where call center machines understand customers' emotions and adjust their behaviors to match. According to Rana Gudral, today's guest on Commerce Code, the time is now. It's a fascinating topic, and we look forward to seeing where emotional AI goes from here. For more information on the role artificial intelligence plays in your ability to craft hyper-personalized offers in your space, sign up for DCA's April Summit. Join fellow members on Tuesday, April 11th in San Francisco and learn more about the next generation of digital offers and payments. Visit www.dhcomall.org to register. Commerce Code is a bi-weekly podcast bringing you conversations with executives who are leading the way in digital commerce. If you like Commerce Code, your company should join the Digital Commerce Alliance and become part of our mission of advancing trade for good through standard setting, industry networking, conferences, and best practice sharing. Check out our website at www.digcomall.org. On behalf of DCA, have a great week.